Hey, welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. Pastor Kim here inviting you to the table. We're going to begin a, a new kind of uh, series here over the next four weeks. We're going to look at um, really Jesus' last week. Uh, the culminates on the resurrection, uh, which is what we're going to look at. So uh, hopefully you're uh, ready, you're a part of... Uh, Got everything you need, your Bible, your coffee, tea, water, whatever it is, your pen, and uh, we don't really have a, a book for this session, per se, but uh, um, I do encourage you to share this on your uh, Facebook page, uh, allow others to be a part and to kind of uh, celebrate what we're talking about here with uh, the resurrection of Jesus, how exciting that is to really uh, it just really proves and, and we can understand how much God really really does love us and so as we begin this evening we're going to be kind of bouncing around um, Mark 11 we're going to be in the area where um, the triumphant entry and then we're going to kind of move through some different sessions there so you might turn your Bible to, to Mark chapter 11 that would get us uh, started there. Um, I am not rooting for any teams here this evening. This is just my, I would call it my Wilcox shirt. Uh, i got a couple different ones. I know there are some colleges that these are for, but I was just so thankful that they gave me the, the W and uh, uh, they're a part of that. So Anyway, this evening, we're glad to have you. Hopefully, you will uh, share this on your Facebook page uh, with your friends, with your story, however it works, and invite them to come along part uh, with us. Uh, just a couple of announcements this evening. Uh, food pantry at Pomona tomorrow for the West Franklin School District from 1 to 4. Uh, we can... Um, We'd really appreciate your prayers. They're talking about rain. Uh, we would like to not have any between 1 to 4. Uh, that would really be great. It can rain at 5 on, whatever it wants. Uh, but anyway, we'd really appreciate your your prayers in that in that direction. Uh, then on Tuesday from 1 to 4, we'll be at the North Baptist Food Pantry for the uh, North Ottawa residents and the Lincoln School District area. Uh, we just uh, um, are excited to be able to uh, communicate with our neighbors uh, that way. So uh, if you are able, we'd encourage you to be in prayer for us and the workers during that time that they can communicate not just uh, food, but really the, uh, the love of Jesus uh, during that time as well. Sunday morning, we are going to be uh, live at 1030, both uh, in person and on Facebook. Uh, no video uh, preceding the service for the next four weeks as we work into Jesus' resurrection. <clears throat> We're going to talk about uh, redemption uh, this week, uh, the blood that was shed. Uh, each week will be a part of really what we're talking about as a, as a whole uh, this evening. Uh, we're we're going to jump ahead. Usually this is the, uh, we think about the last week. Uh, we think about Palm Sunday and, and in through that. But we really wanted to uh, prepare you and your heart this year uh, that you would be ready and and uh, focused and, and be a part of what uh, God is, is doing in your life, uh, what God's doing in the lives of those around you. And uh, so we're excited really to see what, what God's doing this evening. Anyway, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm really just going to invite God's presence um, in and to us with, uh, with, with prayer. Uh, God would reveal himself. Uh, to us through his word this evening, and I, I really pray that uh, you might be able to glean something from this evening as you start to focus on uh, the upcoming uh, season of celebration, where we celebrate the, uh, the victory of Jesus' resurrection. And so with that this evening, if you would join me in prayer. Lord, this evening we really do invite your presence uh, with us. Uh, we know that just this is your word, uh, Lord, this is your word. Um, to all mankind. And Lord, I pray this evening that you would um, bring it to life as you speak to those uh, who will hear this message, hear this uh, study this evening. And Lord, that in everything you will receive the, the glory and honor. 
uh, we do have many that we know are, are struggling with health issues, Lord. We pray for healing uh, upon them, uh, Lord, for those who are uh, suffering emotionally and financially, Lord. We pray that you would uh, draw them to you, that they might see you in this season of time that they're going through. Lord, we thank you for the opportunities of the food pantries that uh, we might be able to minister to uh, to many lives, many hearts, uh, many people through that. And Lord, that they wouldn't just see a physical meal, but they would see the spiritual meal that you uh, truly provide through your son, Jesus Christ. And so this evening, Lord, we're going to look at Jesus' last week. Uh, you know the things that took place, you know what needed to take place, you know what needs to take place in our lives, uh, you need to, you know what we need to hear, and so this evening, Lord, I pray that you uh, minister to that in, in just a great way. So, Lord, we thank you again for technology, we thank you for the opportunity to uh, to share this on on our Facebook, on our webpage, and Lord, that uh, we pray that it's not about, it's not about me, it's not about us, it's not about North Baptist, it's about you and, and sharing and spreading uh, the news of your son, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we thank you that you've given us a voice. You've given us uh, things that we need to be able to communicate with others. And this evening, Lord, uh, we just ask that you be big in the lives of those that hear. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, again, this evening, we're going to start a series uh, that's going to go for the next four weeks. Uh, comes up to the time of April 9th where we celebrate the, uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This evening we uh, are just going to look at a, a whole week's worth and then over the next four weeks we're going to look at, at different aspects of that week. And so this evening uh, we, we talk about Jesus' last week, uh, his last week physically here on on this earth. And we're going to begin this evening in, in Mark chapter 11. Uh, on Sunday morning, we're going to uh, go clear back to the, throughout to the beginning to understand what uh, the purpose was that Jesus came through. Uh, but for this evening's time span that we have, we're going to fast forward that uh, <coughs> we understand that scripture says that uh, Jesus um, came to uh, provide salvation for his people. Uh, he would be the sacrifice for the sins. And in this last week, we're going to see just some of the things that uh, began to take place. And so we're going to look at, we're going to begin this evening on Sunday, which would we would call Palm Sunday, which will be April 2nd this year. And we're going to look at Jesus' royal entry into Jerusalem beginning in Mark chapter 11, 1 through 10. The scripture says that they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany, uh, the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of his disciples saying, go to the village ahead of you and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, while you're doing this, tell them the Lord needs it and send it back here shortly. So they went, found a cold outside the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, well, what are you doing untying that cold? They answered as Jesus had told them and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road and others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. You come to this point in scripture where Jesus had told the disciples multiple times that he would die, but then again on the third day he would be raised to life. Not that they completely understood it, but 
he continued to share that with them. And as it come to this point, uh, they were not excited about his his trip to Jerusalem. He, they knew that uh, several of the Jewish leaders were after Jesus, and they were not excited about that and really didn't want him to go and tried to really hold him back. But at this point, Jesus focused on the mission that he has at hand. And so what we read there just a moment ago was the uh, triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And it's very unique as we see the story unfold now of Jesus' last week as they approached Jerusalem. He told them to go ahead. He said, two, on in. He said, go ahead. And just as you enter Jerusalem, you will find a colt. It'll be tied to one that no one has ever ridden and, and bring it here, bring it to me. And so they, they head into town and lo and behold, there it is. And we always imagine, you know, uh, going into town and untying somebody else's donkey. Uh, what could, what, what could go wrong, right? <laughs> well, lots of things could go wrong. But Jesus had already went before him, and so this is just another aspect of his, bless you, his teaching moment uh, for those that are there in attendance, those that could see and those that could hear. And, and so even for us today, it, it's a message that we need to really grasp a hold of. Uh, one of those messages for us today is that Jesus goes before us. He already knows our our tomorrow, our our next day, uh, the day after that. You know, he he is God, and so he he sees not only past, present, but he sees future as well, and he knows what takes place. He knows what we're capable of when we're connected to him. He knows what we are to be a part of and what his desire is for us. But again, it comes back down to our will. Are we willing to submit our will and our way to him so that he can utilize through his Holy Spirit today, uh, work in and, and through us? And so those disciples, they went in town and lo and behold, there was the cold and they started to untie it and People said, what are you doing? Whoa, whoa, whoa there, right? Is that even yours? And they told him what Jesus had told them to say. Tell them the Lord needs it. And we'll send it back here shortly. He was only going to use it for a period of, of time. And that's the beginning of the of the week. As we look at verse 11, on Mark chapter 11, we see that Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. And so he he spent the night there. So the beginning of this last week of Jesus' life has has now begun. He has a lot of things that he, he's going to do. He's got a lot of things that he's going to say. And it's just like with our loved ones, right? When it comes to the season and time in their life where we know that there might not be much physical time left for them, the things that they say are are cherished by us. They are crucial to us. And really the things they say, really, it's not about, you know, how many cars or homes or land that we have acquired, but it's, it's personal things that are voiced. And so we're going to look over this next hour, uh, 40 minutes, I guess, left, but and some of the things that Jesus said. Some of the things that, that Jesus did. And so the beginning in Mark chapter 11, verse 15 through 19, 
on reaching Jerusalem, now this would be the next day, this is now Monday, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. He would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, it is written. My house should be called a house of prayer for all nations. And so we're the intercede for others. That goes along well with our past Sunday's mission, passport to missions, and those that we spoke of who are continuing to share the gospel. And he said, my house is to be a prayer for all nations, but you've made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him, because the crowd was amazed at his teaching. And so when evening came, they went out of the city. And so Monday now, the triumphant entry had taken place. The, the people, the crowd who had seen Jesus for um, these past really three years as he, as he spoke, as he performed miracles, as he shared, as he, as he loved, as he taught, and as he moved, they, the crowds continued to grow. They, they saw what Jesus could do. They saw what was taking place. And the one thing I shared Sunday morning before we began our service was how did people hear about Jesus in his day? And it was by word of mouth. One person would share with another, and then they would share with another, and they would share with another about what Jesus could do, what Jesus was capable of. What are the possibilities if Jesus came into your town, your home? sat at your table, shared with your family. And so we have that same excitement today, and that's the thing that we miss so much, is that the word is spread one person to another. And so by the time Jesus got to the next place, they had already heard his, those, those words had preceded him there. And so they were looking for Jesus. And it comes to this point, he's coming in Jerusalem. They heard he was coming. And they shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes. Hosanna in the highest. And what, what they're shouting is, is save us, save us now. That, that's what they were hoping for. That's what they wanted. They They weren't completely sure that Jesus was the Messiah. But they saw and heard what he'd done. They heard from others about what had taken place. And so there were some unique things about this guy. So as he, as he comes into Jerusalem, they're excited. He, he's coming in to do something. And what they thought was he was coming in to take control of this Roman oppression, the things that had ruled and they had succumbed to in their lives and it was overwhelming and there was there was such an oppression. It, it wasn't depression. I mean, it was totally oppression. And so they were, they were taxed to the hilt. They were treated poorly. They, uh, all the things that could possibly go wrong was actually going wrong. And so they see Jesus coming in and they thought, oh, here it is, right? He, he's the one. And so he gets in. By the time they get everything done, it's late. They go back out to Bethany. They spend the night. He comes in the next day, and he cleanses the temple. And sometimes we get confused about that. Why did he do that? Well, it's because that as people came in for those sacrifices, those offerings that they were to give... They 
they hadn't brought them themselves. It wasn't a part of who they were. They just came to the door of the temple and they exchanged money for this sacrifice or this offering. They would go in and offer it. And so it wasn't chosen by them. It wasn't the first fruit of their lives. All they had done was just got something out of the candy or pop machine on the way into church. And then that's what they were going to offer. And that's not really what he's wanting. And so he overturned these tables and he said, it's not supposed to be about selling all these things. It's supposed to be about a house of prayer. <clears throat> the things you bring in are supposed to be what you have brought and what you have been blessed by from the Lord. And now you're returning part of that to him. And so he, he cleanses the, the temple, which is confusing to so many. And we look at Matthew chapter 21. We're going to kind of bounce back and forth between Mark 11 and, and Matthew 21. In Matthew 21, verse 18, <clears throat> this is before he got to the temple now. He's at this point, they're, they're leaving Bethany, they're, they're coming back into Jerusalem. Yeah, you might put your pan back there in, in Mark 11, we'll go back there. But early in the morning, uh, as he was on his way back to the city, back to Jerusalem, he was, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it and found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, May you never bear fruit again. And immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly, they asked. Jesus replied, I, I tell you the truth. If you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to this fig tree, but you can also say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and it'll be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in, in prayer. Now, he's not saying at that point that if you're ready for this new car, then all you have to do is ask for it, right? And you're going to receive it. No, he's talking about spiritual blessings. He's talking about being a part and and if you know much about the fig tree, the, the fruit and the leaf grow virtually at the, at the same time. And so as he saw the fig tree by the road, he saw nothing on it except leaves. That meant it was, it was barren. It looked good, but there was no fruit. And he said, may you never bear fruit again. And so... Unfortunately, there's a lot of lessons in that message right there as well. Sometimes we look pretty good on the outside. But there's no spiritual fruit, right? And the spiritual fruit comes from Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, forbearance, if we have that, patience, goodness. <clears throat> Those things just don't come to us on our own. They are fruits of the Spirit. They can only come through our acceptance of Jesus into our lives. And so then the Holy Spirit fills us, and the Holy Spirit then brings in those attributes of God into our life, which are those fruits of the Spirit. So for us, we might look really good. People might see us in church or out and about and think, man, that's really... Uh, a good Christian, a strong Christian, but yet there's no fruit from that life. And so we we wonder, is that really a fruit-bearing tree? Is there is there really life in it? Is Jesus' life really in them? And he goes on to say, you know, if you have faith and, and do not doubt, uh, you can only do what is done, but you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea. As a child, I always remember my mom saying, you know, those, uh, we have mountains that come into our lives. And 
they're not like the ones where you travel to see them, like in Colorado or, or other places like that. It, those aren't the mountains. Those mountains are those obstacles that degrade us and beat us up and overwhelm us every day. And you all know this evening, you know what your, what your mountain is. And you know, on your own, you're not going to be able to get, get over that. But through Jesus' guidance, through Jesus' help, he said, you can tell that mountain to go throw itself in the sea. Because he is much bigger than that. Now, it doesn't mean that there won't be a season of time. Uh, if you've ever been to Colorado, if you've ever walked up the mountainside, uh, that's tough, right? There's, the air is different. There's less air. We, uh, you really struggle to walk. And uh, the older you get, when we were chilling over there last fall, it was harder than it was ever before. <laughs> but with Jesus' help. And though it's through prayer, it's through guidance that those mountains are, are moved. Now Jesus goes on to, to teach him some parables. He debates the rulers in the temple. And then we find, uh, this is on Tuesday, excuse me, the Mount of Olive discord there in Matthew 24 and 25. But we'll look in Matthew 21. We're just going to back up here to Matthew 21, beginning in verse 28. And Jesus tells the parable of the two sons. Again, these are Jesus' words. The, you're on Tuesday of the final week, so the things that he says are, are super important to us. We need to really grasp and understand what he's saying so that way we can use those things in our, in our lives. And so... Beginning in 28, he says, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, <clears throat> go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the other son and said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. And Jesus said, which of the two did what his father asked him? Well, the first they answered. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. The tax collectors, the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe. And so then he tells another parable. The landowner who planted the vineyard, put a wall around it, dug a wine press, and built a watchtower. And then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized the servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time, but the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and Take his inheritance. So they took him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, he will not, or what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to be wretched, the end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants, and he will give his share of the crop at harvest time. And Jesus said, have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become a capstone. And the Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in your eyes. 
as he goes on and on speaking of these parables. And so we can go back to the first one about the two sons. And it is about those that actually will do the Father's will. It's not about saying, yes, I'll go. It's about going. It's about following his direction and following his purpose. The second parable that he told there was very unique because he sent several servants to them. And we look back through scripture and we see prophets and different ones that he had sent for them to hear and to understand. And yet they treated them all poorly. And then he sent his son, not plan B, right? It's always been plan A that Jesus was to come. The prophets were just to foretold the message and the story that Jesus was coming. And so when the son comes, they do the same thing. And we know the story and Yes, he was killed, but really he wasn't because he gave himself as a ransom for us. And for that, we have great hope and great victory. And so there are multiple parables there. We can go on through the uh, Mount of Olives, 20, Matthew 24 and 25, and continue to see those important words of Jesus in that last week. But we move on to Mark chapter 14, and we're going to go to Wednesday now, where Jesus was anointed at Bethany. Mark chapter 14, verses 3 through 9. <clears throat> the Passover, we're on the Wednesday night, right? Passover and had come. Beginning of verse 3, he said, While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table, the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar full of expensive perfume, made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, Why this waste of perfume? He could have been sold for more than a year's wages than the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, Jesus said. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you. You can help them anytime you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Preparing for his burial. It's Wednesday of the final week. Again, this is Passover time, so that's why so many people were in Jerusalem. They had come back for the Passover. They had come back to celebrate the exodus from Egypt of their, of their family, of their people, years before. And so God instituted the Passover then, and it was to be acknowledged every year and it was to be a part of everyone's life and there were certain specific things that they were supposed to do as they did and that's where the multitude came as Jesus rode into Jerusalem that's what had taken place they were there they had come back to their homeland to celebrate who God was to worship to offer these offerings and sacrifices for their sins. And right there on the, the back of this unbroken colt was the lamb that was to be slain. They saw it, but they didn't see it. 
And unfortunately, that, that's the way it is in our lives a lot of times. We, we see it, but we don't really, we don't really get it. We don't really grasp what Jesus has done for us, and he's the only one that could do it. And so here she anoints Jesus with perfume because she knew who he was. She believes what he said. He said in just a few days I would I would die, but I'm going to rise again. And so she's anointing him in advance for this burial. And she took this Oh, we're, we're, we're going to add. It took this alabaster jar of expensive perfume in verse 3, and she poured it on his head. And in another set of scriptures, it says that she wiped her hair on his feet. The smell would have went with her wherever she went, and it would have been something that she would have of recognized, and especially in just a few short days, how important that would be. And as she was able to bring that hair around, it had to be longer than mine, right? But as she brought that hair around and she would smell it, she would know that she had poured that on Jesus' head, anointing him for birth. She, the things that she believed were now coming true. So he was anointed at Bethany. Then we come to Thursday, the Passover. John 13, he washes the disciples' feet. He shows the ultimate humbleness, humility. <laughs> It doesn't say who was supposed to do it. Uh, the, the host of the home would would be the one that did, and they would have the the lowest slave, uh, the servant, would have been the one who would who would wash the feet and cleanse them. If you turn over to John chapter thirteen, we're going to read one through seventeen. John thirteen one through seventeen. You know, in the Bible study class, we've been right here for the last two weeks in this section. We've talked about the importance of it and how that relates not just to Jesus, but to each one of us as well. And that's how we're supposed to live our lives towards one another. And it's a difficult thing because on our own, we're incapable. But with Jesus' help, it's possible. So again, this is Thursday now. The Passover meal, John 13, 1 through 17. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that his time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was served. The devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God, and he was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And he came to Simon Peter, who said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, Peter said, you'll never wash my feet. Jesus said, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, a person who has a had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was to 
going to betray him, and that was why he was, not everyone was clean. When he finished washing the feet, he put on his clothes, and he returned to the place. He said, do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor his messenger greater than the one who has sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Now I'm not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill the scripture, he who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. And so Jesus offers the greatest sense of humility and humbleness as he, as he got down and he washed the disciples' feet and He's telling them to be humble. No one is a, you're not above anyone else. You're not better than the messenger that, that sent you. You're going to be required to do some things that aren't always comfortable, aren't always pretty, <laughs> and with washing feet, they may not always smell good. Amen? Because you know they were within sandals and they were walking the streets of Jerusalem. And who knows what had taken place and was there in the midst of that. And so he washes that the disciples' feet. He, he prays in John chapter 17. The betrayal, the arrests take place. But while they were at the Last Supper, one of the things that always strikes me. In verse 23, one of the disciples whom Jesus loved was reclining next to him. In the New King James it says that he was, his head was on his bosom. John's head was on the chest of Jesus and he could literally hear the heartbeat of God. Can you only imagine what that is like? What that's about? What what has taken place there? And if there's anything at all through Scripture here this evening that you're that you're looking for that you can understand, I I really encourage you then to pray that that becomes you. Pray that you can hear the heartbeat of God. That was John thirteen twenty three, and you'll have to have a a new King James or, or older like that to, to really see the full impact of that scripture. But if you have the Bible app on your phone, you can scan through it. Verse 25 is, is kind of the same. The heartbeat of God. The betrayal takes place, the arrest, and we move on to Friday. The trials in Jerusalem tossed back and forth between Herod and Pilate. Herod and Pilate. Nobody wanted to deal with it. It wasn't something that was really taking place that they would have any kind of authority over. It was the Jews just wanting him out of the way. But it was God's provision for our sin. And so it goes back and forth and back and forth. If you turn on over to John chapter 19 in your Bibles, we're going to look at 16 through 42. John 19, 16 to 42. I, I did say that we were going to have, we're going to be bouncing around a little bit. So uh, we're up to Friday now, right? His arrest had taken place. Beginning in 16, finally Pilate handed him over to them to be Crucified. The verse right before is really interesting, though. I guess I want to go back to it, too. 
But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. The, the crowd, he said, I can release one of these prisoners. Uh, and Jesus really could be it. He couldn't find anything that was at fault with Jesus. And, and they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Shall I, I crucify your king, Pilate asked. And what is ironic, what is mystifying, the Jewish people who are looking for a Messiah shout out, we have no king but Caesar. The chief priest answered that. Now, they, they chose their, their king right there. What, what king will you choose? Will it be the king of this world or will it be the king Jesus? And nobody can choose it for you. It's a choice of your own. And so Pilate hands him over to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the school, which in Aramaic, Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him and him with two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. The sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priest of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them with the undergarment remaining. The garments were seamless, woven into one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled and it said, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So that's what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother. His mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clovis, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing all things was completed so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, and they soaked a sponge and put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Now it was a day of preparation. The next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus. And then the one of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows what he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you may also believe. These things have happened so that Scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And another Scripture says, they will look on the one that they have pierced. Later, Jer Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. 
Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took away the body. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, a man who had earlier visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen, and this was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid, but because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Jesus was crucified. They had taken him down, they'd wrapped his body, and they placed him in the tomb. There's not a lot on what happens on Saturday other than Jesus' rest. In Matthew chapter 27, Matthew 27, 62, to 66, Matthew 27, 62 to 66, the next day after the preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate, sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive and the deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has raised from the dead, the last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. And that leads us to Sunday. The day, right, the day that we all rejoice in and for because of what God has done for us. We're going to go to Luke chapter 24. Luke 24. Begin the beginning of the week with Palm Sunday, right? Jesus rides into Jerusalem. It's the Passover. It's full of people. There's all kinds of people there. They go through all the different things that are taking place. Uh, we see the, the fig tree cursed on Monday. We see the, um, uh, the cleansing of the temple. Tuesday, he continues to teach and teach and teach in, in parables. These are important things that Jesus spoke of the last days of his life. Why would we not want to listen to those things? He debates the rulers in the temple. He, we have the Mount of Olive Discourse, uh, Matthew 24 and 25. On Wednesday, we see Jesus anointed. Anointed for his burial. The betrayal is begun. Thursday, we find the Passover. He washes the disciples' feet. John lays his head against the bosom of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. God incarnate. Jesus prays for his disciples in John 17. Jesus prays for you and I even today in John 17 that we would believe and that our belief would make a difference. We see the betrayal and arrest. We see the trials that take place. We see the crucifixion and the burial. We see the tomb is now sealed and they don't want it open. They're afraid of the disciples, but they're probably more afraid of Jesus. And so in Luke chapter 24, we're going to come to Sunday, right? The victory of Sunday. Resurrection Sunday. It's hard for me to call it Easter, right? We've mutilated that word, I think, in our time. It's Resurrection Sunday. Jesus rose from the dead. In Luke chapter 24, 1 through 15, on the first day of the week, early in the morning, the women took spices 
They had prepared and went out to the tomb. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In fright, the woman bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. Amen. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. Jesus said, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they all told these things to the eleven and to the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, uh, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who, who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed like nonsense. You mean to tell me that Jesus is alive? Right? That's not scripture. That's, that's Kim's rendition of it. Peter, however, he got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. And he went away wondering to himself, what had happened? I don't know, Peter. The women just told you that Jesus rose from the dead. The angels told them. He, Jesus told you. But like Peter, we, we wonder too. What what just happened? What what just took place in my life? What What is going on in this world that we live in? Right? And so then on verse 13... Now the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened, and as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. That's where we're going to end up this evening. Jesus is going to come alongside you. He's going to call you by name. And so our response to him is to believe and follow. We need to be willing to say, I will. I will, Jesus. Whatever you want, I, I will. And as we move forward in that direction, then the importance and the purpose of that is, is where we are today. Let's not get focused on the mountains, right? Right? Let's not get focused on the circumstances, the situations that are bigger than we can handle anyway. How about we just give those to Jesus? Let him move that mountain out of the way as we move through, as we follow him to resurrection victory. That's exciting. That's purposeful. That's scriptural. And that's what Jesus wants you to do. Now, we're going to close out here this evening. Uh, we're moving forward. Each week, we're going to talk about a different aspect of <clears throat> this week, right? We're going to look, for the next four weeks, we're going to look at Jesus' last week. And I pray as we go through this that you are going to pray for yourself that, that Jesus would be just overwhelmed in your presence so that you could hear the heartbeat of God, like John. And don't miss this season of time. And, and don't miss being able to invite others to come alongside you on this journey. There's a great way to uh, begin is with this message here this evening. Invite others to see it, uh, even if it's later on in the week or whenever. Make sure they get a hold of it, get contacted with it so that they can see this. Because this preparation, this evening, is what's going to take us through the next four weeks. And you're going to see what Jesus will let you see. And like he said, it's by faith. Hey, we always give you an opportunity to take part in the ministries at North. Uh, you can do that by giving through the Generosity by Lifeway app. Uh, you can download that on your PC, your tablet, your phone. You can give secretly, securely uh, from your own home. And, and that really goes to help those ministries that we talked about on, on Sunday. Uh, those things that we uh, really, last Sunday, that we feel that are important uh, enough to us to help be a part of the support. 
And so we encourage you to be a part of that as well. Uh, we, we thank uh, you for what you have given and how you have been able to uh, bless those different ministries and, and that we're a part of. And so what a, what a blessing you are to us. You can also do that by mailing a check to the church, put attention to Linda on the envelope, get to the same place. You can come and join us any Sunday. We'd love to have you in person. Uh, you can join us, and then at that point, you can uh, drop it in the offering plate up front as you come in or as you leave and, and just share in those ministries as well. Again, this is the... This evening is really, uh, it's, a, it's a chartered time. Uh, we're going to go on a journey for the next four weeks. I invite you to be sure and be on that journey with us. Man, let's look for Jesus. Let's see him in the midst of this. And uh, let's see what he can do about moving that mountain out from in front of you. Amen. Hey, we're going to see you. Uh, if I don't see you before Sunday morning, uh, know that we love you and you are very important to us. So with that we say, good night.